We did talk about uh, a firm many years ago. I think yeah. it was about, a, how long it was it ago? 10 years ago? No, no, seven. Seven, we were at, we were at an event and I, we ended up writing about it. Yeah. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit, are you okay? I'm trying to see, if people there can hear go. me. Yeah. I, I can hear myself. Um, so so you, right, let's, talk, let's start from the beginning with, a, uh, with news that just broke about you going into the savings business. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about that? By news you mean leaks. Whatever, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's either here nor there, right, how it got right, out. Right. Um, a firm is fundamentally about providing financial services. It turns out to mostly millennial customers, but we go to where the people take us. Uh, we started out providing sh short-term point-of-sale loans, then we were... Based on social media profiles? And... No, actually... Well, based uh, on lots of, lots of... So we started out, we asked the question, hey, can we underwrite using some alternative data that, right. while legal, since it's a very regulated space, is not used by banks, and the answer is yes, but it's not social media. Mm -hmm. We tried, there's no signal there. Mm -hmm. Your friends do not really correlate very well to how well you'll do on a loan. Mm -hmm. But um, we started out with these loans, and they were initially very short term. Over time, we realized that people sometimes need to buy really expensive things, and so we extended into long term. At this point, we'll go as short as three months and as long as 39 months. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in that process, we also found out that people sometimes want to store their money, um, which we didn't actually expect to be drawn into, so to say, but our customers love us. Like Our net promoter score is 80 plus, has been 83 mm -hmm. and higher for seven years now, um, in part owing to the fact that we took a hard stand on not screwing our customers ever under any circumstances. And so at some point, we saw the, the draw to so get into it, our, wanting to keep their money or money they borrow from you in terms of? Um, because it was a leak and not an announcement, I will spare you the exact details of what mm -hmm. we're thinking of, but uh, we generally believe that every financial product out there as offered by the old guard is pretty devoid of digital transformation mm -hmm. and there's an opportunity to reinvent everything. So point of sale lending is not a new idea. It's been done by a whole bunch of banks for a long time. And right. the business model there is let's screw the customer. Let, let's catch by them yeah, by charging hidden fees. There's this thing called deferred interest with clawback where you say it's 0%, but not really because if you're a little late or you know this or that, it flips back in time and compounds from the time of purchase sometimes for as long as a decade. So you can really get hurt. Um, a lot of retailers are very familiar with these uh, point of sale issued credit cards, which are generally the business model is to screw the customer and hope they don't notice. Uh, another, a lesser evil but similar one, some of the newer companies in the space are also doing the same thing where you sort of charge 0% interest, but the late fees are fairly egregious. So we, we took a hard stand against all those things and basically said we're going to charge no late fees under any circumstances. You can be late, we will remind you, but we, won't, we will not take your money any more than we promise. So what you see is what you get, the, the promise and a sticker, is the exact number of dollars that you could ever possibly owe us. Um, that same idea of let's unpack the business model and bring transparency and most importantly keep our promises to the shopping buying public is, is sort of what drives the product roadmap. Those concepts can be applied to savings, to credit cards, to all sorts of other things, to loyalty point management which I think is relevant for this crowd. So I think we plan to apply our, our take on what's good and what's honest in finance to everything Savings is just the one that happened to have leaked out. Do, do they, does that make you a bank? Do you, do you think of yourselves as a bank now? Because, I mean, banks land, ba banks, banks a, bank do is a very, savings, very, banks do credit cards. Uh -huh. Bank is a very specific word in mm -hmm. this country anyway. It means a very specifically regulated entity. So sort of the bad, bad news is that, no, we're not a bank because we don't have a charter, but we are regulated pretty much exactly like one. We have rich relationships with regulators, as everyone in this space does. You know, everyone that processes transactions, lends at the point of sale, has to talk to the alphabet soup of FDIC, state regulators, OCC, mm -hmm. FTC. So we are under the same level of scrutiny, which is fine. I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get to it eventually, but I am a proponent of regulation, mm -hmm. in, at least in our space, because generally allows to separate kind of the amateurs from professionals. If, if you're willing to stand up to the scrutiny of a real government official, you probably mean to be around for a long time. If you're okay. trying to hide and say nothing to look at here, it, it's a sign of something to be concerned about. Uh, but no, we're, we're not a bank. Um, I think at some point the question can be asked in a, in a louder voice, but right now 
we use what's called a bank partner model where there is a bank, as it happens in the state of New Jersey, that we partner with and all the bank specific things happen with them. by them and then right. we together go to the regulators and explain why this works and why it's safe for consumers and things like that. And why not just get a charter for yourselves? Um, it's probably eventually where the road will lead to for, again, all the participants in sort of a new bank, new transactional space. Uh, it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. It's not something you can kind of decide to do overnight. But again, being generally pro-regulation, mm -hmm. it's not a simple thing. All right, so you're in savings. You not, doing, not yet, we have not You, you will be in savings, or you might be in savings. I might be. You're trying out savings. Um, what about credit, the credit card business? How do you look at that business? This is like a trigger word for me. Yeah, okay, so, um, all right. It's okay. so, <laughs> Calm down. No, no, no. I, I, What's your other trigger words? <laughs> Watch this. So, Yahoo. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, no. Yahoo board. Um, Yahoo anyway, board. Oh, the board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Max no, was so on the, the board of Yahoo. For a long time. Yeah. Um, it was a good learning experience. Okay. Um, me too. Anyway, move along. That means something else these days. Yeah. Um, so credit cards, credit cards, the reason they're a trigger word for me is because the business model for a credit card is exactly the same business model for payday lending, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally the ability to refinance your debt in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Don't pay any more than you must, just pay a minimum payment. It will sit there revolving, gathering interest. And you know, if, if, if you're good, you'll just be forever in debt. And if you're bad, you'll declare bankruptcy and we'll do it again later. And I, I think it's a terrible, terrible product. Most consumers should not be using credit cards, sort of my personal opinion. Uh, however, the user interface of sort of dropping your plastic or chipping and pinning or whatever you want to be is actually a great user interface. So at some point, we think we'll have an answer to same user interface, much better financial product underneath. The, the reason I'm so passionate about what Affirm does mm -hmm. is we took this you know, fairly complicated thing of paying for things over time and figuring out is there an interest, is there no interest, like all these things, and we really crushed it down to very simple idea pay over three months or six months or 12 months, and in about a third of our cases, just pay no interest at all right. because the retailer is subsidizing so the, the interest. So the retailers. Retailer and that, and that allows the retailer, as you told me, to, to not discount, but exactly. discount. Exactly, maintain price integrity by saying, look, it's always $500 for this thing, things. but in this case, it's $500 over three payments, or over six payments, or over 12 payments, and we'll, we'll cover the interest, don't worry about it, which is discounting, but it's right. discounting without ever communicating the price has to change. Mm -hmm. um, and in the other, you know. Uh, That's a rest, third of your business now. It's about a third of our business. Right. And uh, two thirds of our business is where consumer pays something. Mm -hmm. But um, as a technology company, what we do is we figure out exactly what is the right match between the amount the consumer will pay and the merchant can, uh, can subsidize so, to make sure the transaction actually happens. So mm -hmm. we, we see ourselves fundamentally as a marketing tool, conversion enhancement tool for the retailers. And mm -hmm. we've done unbelievably well there. Our typical AOV increase is about 2x. Typical uh, transaction conversion rate is like 30 to 40% depending on the industry. So I think the number one reason, the number, no, number one word our customers use when they speak to what makes a firm a firm, say it is so simple. I have this sense of control. Control is an amazing word. Right. But what, when, you, when you deal with retailers, since retailers really are your business versus because of these no fees promises, what, is the, what would be a, an argument why they should stop using credit cards and stop using that? Because it, that's it's, how people buy. It's too early. Oh, no, no, I, I don't think I'm not here to, to tell anyone stop using X or Y. I, I think that's a fundamentally consumer choice thing, and retailers of all companies know better than Mm -hmm. you know, to, to tell consumers what to do. They're in the, server, in the business of enabling consumers to do what they want to do. I think credit cards as they exist today, the user interface is fantastic. The underlying financial product is borderline toxic. Mm -hmm. I think a firm product, a firm loan, is a near perfect financial product because once you see here's the loan, here's the schedule, here's how long it's going to take, nothing changes. If you're late, if something happened to you, if you know, dog ate your homework or you had a medical emergency, we will not take advantage of it. Like the, our whole business is built in this idea of we will stick to our promise even if something happens to you, which is what, where we get our very high NPS from. That product can be built into a piece of plastic. It just takes a lot more work and a lot more technology. And so that, that's where I think the future of payments will go. We plan to show the way, but I think over time, retailers will find more and more products that like I just described becoming the dominant thing. 
because millennials are very actively opting out of credit cards. I mean, right. th those tools will be replaced by something else. I happen to believe that what we've built is the replacement code. So in the opting out against credit cards, talk a little bit about some of the newer products like the Apple card. Mm -hmm. um, how that is you, still a credit card. That's still a credit card. However, actually, I have to give them full props. This is the first credit card that I'm aware of that doesn't charge late fees. Right. Thank which you. I think up until now, I used to say two things are true in commerce. There's only one company that doesn't charge late fees, and that's a firm. And there's only one company where if you say it's 0%, you'll pay no interest, you'll pay no fees. The only one that you can trust is a firm, where we will not charge you late fees, we will not charge you interest. Mm -hmm. The first claim is no longer entirely true. If you're good enough to get yourself a Marcus-powered Apple card, you too can enjoy no late fees, which I think is awesome. I think the fact, and you know, it's a it's a partial solution, as they used to say in math class. Where uh, I, I, I wasn't wish... in that math class, but go ahead. I... It's a partial solution. Partial maybe. solution. So um, where should they go? Where, where should a company like that go? I think the next step for them to say, you know, what there, there are all this all this opportunity to say places where you should not pay interest. Places mm -hmm. where, but by the way, I, th I think interest is a perfectly legitimate concept. Time value of money, if the retailer doesn't have the margin, doesn't want to subsidize it, then consumers should pay time value of money. That, that's very fair. The idea of, oh, it's a tiny little interest, it just compounds and compounds and compounds, is a scary idea. Most people are not good at figuring out exponential functions, and compounding interest is all about exponential growth. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, you're bankrupt. And so. The ability to say these are simple interest loans, like ours, or loans that have a cap on interest, where once you've paid as much as we promised you would, you can't pay a penny more, even if you're late. So all of those tools exist, and they've been around forever. It's just the credit card industry has chosen to allow consumers to trip over themselves. Do you imagine Apple will do that, will move into it? I'm certainly not uh, qualified to opine on what they'll do, but I think Given what they've done with the Apple Card, I suspect they're spiritually aligned with the idea mm -hmm. of doing the right thing for, for the consumer, even if it means making less money, by the way. So, because they want more transactions, they have all, it's one usefulness I think on they're, the they're, I, I, I generally believe Apple when they say they want a love affair with the consumer. I, th mm -hmm. I think they sell extremely nice, pretty expensive things, and they want to convince the consumer that when they're putting their money down for an Apple product, they're, they're getting something that is truly special. So let's talk about the competitive landscape right now. But I'd first, before we do that, what are the signals? We did, you did start off with social media. You had all kinds of ideas that were different, like what are the signals for people not paying back their loans? Mm -hmm. what, how has that changed? And how do you look at that when you're, when you're deciding on this? We've gotten smarter about it. That, that's one change. Uh, there's a bunch of fundamental things that we've learned. One is that social media really does not have any signal, and so we don't really. That's what I think. What's our, <laughs> yeah, I mean, writ large, there's just yeah. you know no no signal on social media. Period. Probably. Um, Why but did you think there was that it was? What, what you, you mentioned my last gig. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to understand people. What was the name of that company? I've forgotten it already. <sighs> it slid out of it my. Had it, it had sheep. It had sheep involved. Uh, slide was. Slide. That's yeah. right. Okay. You know, it was a great experience, great learning experience. Okay, all right, um, good. Just like Yahoo Board. But um, the, the idea was simple. You know, people are pouring their heart out on social media. There must be some signal there. Mm -hmm. Maybe it will relate well to, um, to their, their ability to pay. And no, it doesn't. People pretend to be something they're not. That's mm -hmm. a short version. But uh, what we do have is... <laughs> That's uh, a very short version. <laughs> What we do but know like it, about uh, people is that because we integrate very deeply with our retailer partners, we see more than credit cards. Credit cards do not understand what is being purchased. They just know the amount that's right. being spent. Right. We actually work with our retail partners and kind of become an, a little bit of an outsourced dev shop for them, where mm -hmm. we really work on this notion of what kind of a customer will want to have a 0% three installments or six installments or whatever that will compel them to buy something, that will make them feel comfortable that this is actually something they can afford or this is a luxury they would normally deprive themselves of, but this time around they'll say yes. So all of that research goes into every retailer relationship that we forge. Within that knowledge of what's being purchased and how people think about it, there is a sort of a, the exhaust knowledge of, and here's how they pay for it over time. Mm -hmm. And so we've gotten very, very smart at underwriting with the uh, SKU level information that we get from our retail partners. The other thing is that, not for everyone, certainly since it's kind of burdensome, but one of the sort of true measures of someone's financial ability is their cash flow. Mm -hmm. So being able to ask someone, hey, please log into your bank account, let us have a look at your cash flow, and then we'll figure out what is truly affordable for you. One of the sort of a 
beautiful downsides, I think, of our business model is because we don't benefit when someone's late or there are mm -hmm. no, no tricks, no fees, we are fundamentally aligned with the person. If they're late, if they can't pay, we don't make any money either. And so we're very, very good at telling them, you can, and here's a yes, or hey, this is a bad idea. Like, we, do, we don't think this is a good financial transaction for you, which is why we tend to be such you know, in good partnership with, with retailers, because they want to return transactions. They want people to come back and say, I felt good about this one. Even if I heard a no, still felt good. And so in some cases where we think we may be misunderstanding someone, we ask them to log into their bank account and we see their cash flow. So you, one of the things you do is have a lot of information about what people are purchasing, logging into their bank account. Yeah, absolutely. Something people are worried about with, with as, tech as well companies. they should. Yeah. Yes. So talk a little bit about that. What is the because the, the landscape right now is not and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use this time to ask you because you were um, the chairman of Yelp for eleven years and today Google's being sued by every state in the union um, for being big. Uh, among other things. Um, that, that's probably a bad reason to be sued. But, yeah, but uh, that's not why. That's, right. uh, so, so, so privacy, first of all, privacy, security is super important. So mm -hmm. I think that that's a, it goes without saying, should go without saying, although these days, maybe who knows. Um, again, without saying, but we store data. You know, we're certified in every imaginable certification. We really do take this stuff very, very seriously. At this point, we have massive partnerships you know, from Walmart to Peloton to all these sort of very, very large, very successful companies that requires contractually to certify and audit and verify and double check and triple check that we actually store this data both at rest and in transit at a level that is not really penetrable and all that stuff. So from the sort of pure, will we get caught out and someone walking away with your customer data, we have to do everything we possibly can and rep to it and get tested. So that part I feel good about, although I have a paranoia when it comes to data security, given that that's actually my background from the past. I'm looking for a piece of wood to knock on. But um, the thing that I think consumers should be concerned about more than anything is the question, what does the company do with the data willingly? Right. Where do they actually put it to work? And where's the opportunity to leak someone's private data or sell it? So a huge component of how we run the business is we make this promise to the, to the customer. We will not use their data on, in a way that that's not how it's been disclosed to them. We will not sell it to anyone. We've never mm -hmm. sold a piece of data and, and will not. Uh, and so on. Actually, I literally this morning was uh, emailing a friend of mine who is in a hedge fund business and said, hey, ever thought of selling your data to a hedge fund to, to trade on and be an amazing mine of gold? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, probably the one thing I will never do is that. Mm -hmm. And uh, much to my amazement, he responds saying that's probably a good idea given mm -hmm. the... Uh, the, the environment. The, given the do you environment. get affected by the environment, even though I mean, the, do you feel like the overall tech industry is not, even those that that are supposedly protecting data don't seem to be doing that? You know, I think I mean, I, I watch the environment since I'm a part of it. Um, we tend to march to our own drum. I mean, this is, you, you sort of you enjoyed making fun of my last gig, and mm -hmm. in, in retrospect, I enjoy making fun of it too. But um, I feel that. A firm is sort of the thing that I was born to do. Like the, mm -hmm. I have an enormous amount of passion for financial services, just how much consumers get screwed, how retailers are stuck with these ancient products that they really deserve better. And so I'm very, very, very focused on what we do and how we do it. So this idea of doing good while helping our partners and ourselves do well is really important to me. Protecting consumer privacy is something that's pretty fundamental to it. Like we go to extreme extent. But the but the but the downstream impact of everything that's happened, whether it's a hacking, whether it's data usage, whether it's leaking of data, how does how does that change? Because that's one of the things that I think prevents people from feeling particularly safe. I think I think people worry. I think mm -hmm. people actually ask the question: What happens to my data? Do I have a right to be forgotten? Can I be wiped out from your database, um, and you have to build features that support that. I, I don't think there's a... But the overall industry does. What has to happen with it? Why do you think it continues to not take these issues seriously? I think people do more so. I think what hasn't happened yet is a concerted public response by the tech company saying, we take this very seriously, and here's how, and here's... I mean, there's plenty of certification. You can get you know, certified to an extreme degree of data security, but consumers somehow don't find that out until someone gets broken into and they're like, oh yeah, well, we lapsed in our security audits. And so I think, if anything, tech companies that care about this stuff need to do a better job communicating how much they care and what they do about it. Mm -hmm. And that also will, I think, drive up those that don't care. They'll mm -hmm. say, well, okay, maybe we, can't, we can no longer claim to be 
just an impartial right, observer. Right. Um, I, I, think, I think that that's what I. I want to see one more, competitors. How do you look at the? Do you think banks are your competitors? They've been they first they were sort of hostile to companies like yours and SoFi and all the rest of them, and now they're sort of speaking that talk. Uh, I think banking ecosystem in the U.S. especially is a vast array of players. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few actors, in, in particular in our space, the point of sale issued issuers. It's very hard for them if you look at their public filings. They're all public companies, so we can see this. Um, for a typical point of sale issued credit card, about half the profits come from uh, fees. Yeah. So uh, you're kind of you know if you if you want to play along, it's very hard because you have to lop off half your profits, and that's just impossible for a public company. Um, so, but those are actually relatively few. Other banks that, especially sort of super regional, regional banks, smaller banks that serve a specific community are actually hungry to partner. They typically come to us and say, you guys are not a bank. You are not equipped to store 100% of your loans on your own balance sheet. We'd like to buy them. We'd like to participate in them somehow. And they do. So we, we partner very well. We have a whole list of bank partners that have been great to us, and we would like to believe we've been good to them. I think you know, I have a little bit of a holy war against these. You know, I, I call them predatory products, although you know, they just look like nicer rates, but they're still similar to payday lending. I think those banks really would like to uh, see a firm go away somehow, but at this point, it's unlikely. So there, they're, I'm sure they're fighting both in, in the marketplace as well as behind the scenes in Washington, places like that. All right, speaking of Washington, I want to finish up, and then we can have questions from the audience. Um, you were the chairman of Yelp for 11 years. Um, Yelp was the one company sort of crying in the wilderness about Google and now Facebook, obviously, because the two of them sort of split up the ad market, um, but Google, especially um, in the search market. Um, there hasn't been a search product since forever, essentially, or any right. other alternate. Uh, the ad space, there hasn't been a new ad partner besides Google and Facebook, and there hasn't been a new social media company since Snapchat. Um, you could go on in, in several. Mm -hmm. You can move into commerce very easily with Amazon. but. Um, there was a story in the New York Times today about Apple's App Store and the way they facilitate their their apps for uh, when you're looking for, say, podcasting or whatever. So, how do you look at what happened? What's been happening today? Which of these state attorney generals? There's obviously been uh, Macon Del Rahim from the, uh, the the Justice Department is talking about it. It seems to be the only thing that Democrats and Republicans can agree on at this point. They can't agree on lunch, but they can agree that big tech needs serious uh, things. So here you were fighting this as chairman of Yelp for a long time. How do you look at what's happened? There's, there's a lot of places to go from there. Um, my Yelp experience is very dated at this point. It's been, mm -hmm. I think, five years since I stepped off that board. So it, I'm definitely not on top of anything going on on the inside. Same, but it's the same thing that you were all complaining about. Um, I, I think the thing that makes Google both so powerful and so dangerous to companies like Yelp is they provide an enor incredibly important distribution opportunity. So you can buy ads, you can optimize your Google pages, and there's all kinds of amazing stuff that you can deliver to the world if you just know how to sort of leverage people's insatiable need to search for things. However, when Google wants to be in your business, there's a natural conflict of interest. That's, I'll, I'll leave that where that is since I think that that's now going to play out in the courts. Um, I think the broader topic, which is a real one, sort of what do you do about it from the point of view of regulating a market? Mm -hmm. And you know, from Senator Warren, you hear just chop them up into $50 billion pieces and everything's going to be OK. Um, from um, others, you hear other things. My political views are generally kept to my own head because I, I try to avoid, but for what it's worth. Um, I think chopping them up is a terrible mistake because all these companies are international and they compete with other international companies that, in case of China, enjoy the support and kind of a quasi-monopolistic or some, sometimes sort of real monopolistic, at least geographically uh, limited, um, propping up by their local governments. So telling Google, let's cut you up into 25 little BB Googles, but then you go on and take over the world, you know, that, that's really not setting them up for, for success for this country. On the flip side, I think regulation is essential. And I think the fact that financial services have always been a regulated industry, and we live in it, and so do our competitors, and so do sort of, you know. So you're every, used to it. I'm used to it. I also, I also think of it as good housekeeping. Like, I, I generally prefer to let free market 
economies play themselves out and find the lowest price and the best product and all that stuff. I think that that's generally very healthy. But when the time is involved, for, you know, for a classic example, I was fairly vocal in my support for all the various demolition of various discriminatory laws about various bathrooms and all the stuff a couple of years ago. And you know, if you open a pizza shop that says no gays are allowed, eventually someone will open a pizza shop next door that says gays are welcome. Mm -hmm. And free market will take care of that problem and the discriminating pizza shop will be out of business because the more people will go to the one that's all inclusive. But it'll take a long time. And meanwhile, a bunch of people will be deprived and or insulted or driven out of town. And so regulation is there to fix the time that it takes for the market to self-correct. So in situations like my little imaginary pizza shop or these really large companies that eventually someone will invent a great way to search. Maybe it'll be brain plugs, maybe it will be... Brain plugs? I don't even want to know. We'll go, we'll talk about that. It'll later. know what you want. Okay. You, you don't need to type anything. There's not going to be any brain plug in Kara Swisher's head, but go ahead. You know, no. Uh, I've seen some amazing brain plugs. Okay. But uh, I really have. But um, I think the idea of regulatory normalization of markets where eventually you can see the solution but it's just not forthcoming is exactly the right thing to do. And so in that sense, I don't know whether it has to be through courts or attorney generals or whatever, but yeah, it, it wouldn't be such a bad thing to have a, a little bit more of a rigid framework of here's what's okay and here's what's not okay. And maybe Yelp wouldn't have to complain. Right, okay, that's a good reasonable answer. Um, so we I'm have reasonable. questions, you're very reasonable. Questions from the audience? Questions, right here. Thanks. Um, I'm curious a little bit more on the privacy question. Like, how do you think about uh, use of data for consumers across different retailers? Right? Both what do you think is right from a policy standpoint, and how do you make clarity to the consumer about what's being done? And then also, you know, not just directly using data, but you talked about, hey, you're building more sophisticated models of what a consumer is going to respond to, right? So how do you think about privacy in terms of use of data to build those more sophisticated models? I think from, I mean, the good news is that this particular area is reasonably well covered in terms of regulation. So there's a bunch of things that you do or you think in terms of, and most of it can be summed up to do what you said you will do. And so you really cannot mislead or misrepresent lest you want to find yourself fined or put out of business. Um, the way we think about using data is generally to add value in the way that allows us to basically pull in whatever information we have access to and not leak anything out to the retailer. In other words, we can say things like, hey, of these items, we have some idea of which ones might be more interesting to this consumer, but we will not tell you who this consumer is until and unless they choose to go close the transaction. That's sort of a sketch of an example, but in general, you should be able to confine insights that you've gotten from data that could be considered sensitive by someone to where the data was collected. In other words, the ecosystem needs to be reasonably closed, if that makes any sense. Um, I think in general, another great test, and this is sort of a back to a prehistoric times, if somebody were to explain what a firm does with consumer data on the front page of New York Times, that should either be just fine with me or should be a little bit sort of squirm-inducing. And at the moment, it's just fine with me, and I think that's a really, really good test for any CEO, both retail, financial services. If somebody said, here's what they do once they know who you are or what you did, like, that's, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good way of just designing systems, yeah. I think. That's really good. Last question, really quick. I'll, I'll try to answer quickly, too. Okay. Hey, Max. Um, I would love your thoughts on Libra, Facebook's oh, project. Yeah. And um, would, yeah, a firm, right? would a firm be interested in being a part of the association? Not as bad as Facebook dating, but go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm long out of the dating market. But, you're my uh, secret crush, Max. I'm teasing, you're not. Fe feeling is mutual. <laughs> um, I, I aspire to, uh, to be called reasonable by you. That, that's okay, all I really okay. need. Right, um, okay. So very quickly, Libra. 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 So Libra. generally, I think it's a good development in a sense that it's sort of first act is clearly aimed at providing sort of run for the money to those that do cross-border um, remittances. Yeah. And that is an obscenely overpriced, under-value-adding system. If you sort of look at, you know, I have relatives um, 
in the old country, so to say, and uh, sending the money is between 7 and 9 percent of the value while the transaction is done over the public internet. So that, that should tell you everything you want to know. Running it on the blockchain, that's a really great tool to uh, recruit engineers. I'm not sure that was strictly necessary, but that's sort of, you know, that, that's for the designers of, uh, and actually I, I think the, the blockchain inclusion of, in, in this project was all about saying, hey, even though we're Facebook and you may have your concerns, it's fine, it's all out in the public eye. So I think that actually, that, that may have been what that was all about. But generally, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on the remittances part of it. I think the long-term play of Libra is another way to shop, which is sort of, you know, we're embedded in every wallet and you can transact in this sort of a new currency, is fascinating. And this would take another half an hour to sort of debate, you know, do you need to build up enough balances before you have retailers caring about this new currency, or do you need to just get a bunch of retailers to say, let us offer you special incentives to shop using Libra because we bought into it? Um, don't know, but it, it's the right kind of experiment to run. I think that that's another sort of, you know, it, obviously there the, uh, the sort of target competitor is Visa and MasterCard, and it's a fascinating conversation to, uh, to, to have. Um, a firm is not a part of the Libra Association, so uh, I have nothing to... Do you want to wanna be? Um, they, have like I 80, suspect, they have like 80 spots open. I suspect so. he was asked. That's what I think he just said. <laughs> um, no, actually, on the record, I was not asked. Oh. Um, but um, I think if David Marcus were to call me up and said, hey, um, you should be a part of this thing, I would definitely not hang up the phone. I think it's a... I, I'm, I'm a generally a big sort of a techno-utopian bull. I believe that with the right regulation and the right technology, you can build good things, and you don't have to be embarrassed by the fact that you're building stuff, so long as you're willing to read about how you're doing it on the front page of the New York Times. Um, and I think this is another step in generally the right direction. I'm sure there are ways to screw it up and do it wrong. And we've certainly, as a tech industry, we've screwed up plenty and done things wrong. But there's a way to do it right, too. And I think doing it right is always fun. Oh, he's so hopeful. I like that. Anyway, thank you so much, Max Levshin.